I know there was a bit of a wake-up call in England, but uh, if you remember, you know, Australia was not quite uh, as strong a team as England was in England. And the pitches were, you know, expected to be easier and uh, uh, India had a fit 11. Praveen Kumar was the only uh, notable, uh, you know, guy missing from that lineup. So, yes, better results were expected. But because of what had happened in England, there was a bit of faith lost, I think, not just with me, but with a lot of cricket fans, because this was a similar kind of a challenge, overseas challenge, against a pretty decent team. So, yes, a result uh, 4-0 is quite shocking indeed. And I hope uh, it's not just us who are shocked by this, the players and the administrators, everyone, because then good things will happen from this. Uh, it's a question uh, that uh, will be answered with time because, you know, sometimes uh, you wonder whether it's the batting that makes the bowling attack look a lot better than they were. There was no doubt that England was a quality attack uh, in England. Pitches also helped. You know, I don't think there were flat pitches right through that series. But when bowling attack senses that the opposition is uh, a little unprepared, unsure, almost timid at times, it just becomes that much easier. And when you have two bowlers, uh, strike bowlers bowling well, then the other two also, you know, have that support. So it's all a bit of a team game and they thrive on the uncertainty of the opposition. Um, I think that was emphasized more in Australia because uh, clearly this is not as good a bowling attack as England was in England. But towards the end of the series, it looked a great bowling attack. So I think uh, we have to leave a little, leave a little bit of margin for this possibility that maybe currently the kind of batting form and the mental uh, setup of the Indian batsman is such that, uh, you know, good bowling attacks are now looking like great bowling attacks. It was almost agonizing for me that, uh, you know, things that happen on the field, I, I don't buy the argument that the players are not trying hard enough, they're taking things casually. I don't think that ever is the case. Uh, it's just a misreading of body language. And when you're losing continuously, your body language tends to become a little flat. You know, it, it's a depressing scenario. So I never hold that against the players. But there are some things that can be controlled. And that is how you respond to situations. And it was really distressing for me right through the series to see that India wasn't willing to change their methods, almost like a stubborn approach that they had right through the series where the core batting unit that was delivering failure after failure wasn't changed at all. I mean, any man who is involved in um, any kind of uh, activity, business, profession, whatever, if you have the same method giving the same results and if you're not willing to change, you know, what do you call that? So I just couldn't understand why India wasn't willing to change anything once we are halfway through the Australian series and the results that we had in England uh, were repeating itself. So that for me was most agonizing, not just the batting unit. Uh, even a guy like Ishan Sharma wasn't paying the price for his performance, not in just the Australian series, but the series before that at home against West Indies, against England. So basically what really was the most difficult thing for me to accept was that non-performance wasn't getting penalized. In fact, it was getting rewarded by one more you know, chance by this uh, selection uh, party on the tour. I've got nothing against the selectors who picked a squad of 17, but the guys who picked the 11, I, didn't, I don't think they did a good job at all on that tour. You know, I hope it's just posturing. You know, sometimes uh, as a guy who is in charge of a performing unit, that unit fails, then, you know, you say certain things that uh, where you want to show that, uh, you know, it was a bit of an aberration and there's nothing wrong there. So I hope that is only for public consumption. Uh, in that meeting on the 13th of February, I hope the people who matter sit there and then be very honest with themselves because uh, England you know, was trying to tell us something, Australia has clearly told us something and it's a humiliating loss. You know, just imagine, think about it and keep thinking about it. Eight consecutive test match defeats and four of them innings defeat. One of them could have been an innings defeat because, but Australia chose not to enforce the follow-on. That could have been five. So I think that has to be um, 
the first thing that Indian cricket needs to accept that this is one of the more humiliating losses in the history of cricket. And at this stage, when India has been around for more than 75 years, uh, it has a lot of experience at the test level. It has everything going for it. It's the number one, you know, sort of popular sport. So this result is just not acceptable. And I think that is important. So all this talk about denial and you know overseas everyone fails when they come back home we'll show them you know how good we are and all that i just hope that's for public display it does and that's the beauty of test cricket you know if this was a one-day loss i think people get over a one-day loss pretty quickly a great example of that was uh, england in australia when they beat uh, australia in the ashes at uh, in the test series and that was followed by a humiliating one-day loss just before the World Cup for England where they lost, I think, six one-day matches or something like that in the seven games that they played. But nobody remembers that. So that's the beauty and that's why I think Test cricket needs to be around because it actually tells you really how good a team is. Uh, because that's a, that's a game that has some depth and the depth of a country's cricket is actually revealed in Test match performances. And that's where I think... Uh, the impact of a good or a bad performance in a test series uh, lingers for a long time. So yes, you know, I, I'd like to believe and I'm pretty certain that all the players who failed on that trip, the captain, everyone around the team would feel it, it will rankle. I think this loss will rankle. I'll tell you what, um, you know, because I'm on Twitter these days, you know, I'm actually first time I'm in actual direct contact with the cricket fans, the Indian cricket fans. And let's not forget, you know, everything evolves in life and uh, an Indian cricket fan is also evolving. And I have no doubt in my mind that the Indian cricket fan of 10 years back and the Indian cricket fan of today, the fan of today is a lot more evolved, more intelligent, and he, he knows exactly, you know, what's happening. So a good one-day performance will, you know, they'll feel happy about it. The media will pick it up, uh, that people who are invested in Indian cricket will pick that up and, you know, uh, try and show that Indian cricket is fine. But I think a lot of Indian cricket fans know now exactly, you know, what is important and a good IPL season and all that, the fanfare and the fun and everything will continue. But I think they know exactly, you know, how good their national team is. And also now... Clearly, each and every fan on the street also is aware of the differences between the cricket that's played at home and overseas. So any good performance at home, fans will enjoy it. But one bad performance overseas and they'll be hurt and they'll be again, you know, very critical and hard on the Indian team. Um, I'm always a big fan of somebody. You know what happens sometimes? We are so closely involved with anything that a guy who's watching from a distance, you know, clinically, sometimes can tell you something that you would not be aware of. But that is not to say that people who are in power uh, aren't aware of what needs to be done. So if you're, you know, aware and if you're willing to make the changes where it's needed, I didn't see that in the tour selection committee. You know, I, I can't buy this argument that they had no idea what was going wrong. But because they were not willing to change it, you don't need an August review to come and tell them that this needed to be changed. So I think that has to be uh, looked into why the tour selection party wasn't willing to change anything despite so many losses. So as I said, I think there's always merit in somebody who's away from the game to come and tell you all that. Uh, but if you're willing to look at yourself hard and if you know such losses hurt you, you can still, you know, make a change without the Argus review. I think this is the time when the chairman of selectors becomes the one very important member or one important person in Indian cricket. The one thing he needs to do is, you know, start working on his communication skills because you can't just dump a senior player. Uh, it's important that he's in a dialogue now with the players. He should have been in dialogue with these players ideally for the last one or two years because they were aging, they were not getting any younger and one or two of them were looking really quite aged on the field. So that should have been sort of a signal that it's a matter of concern despite the skills, the fitness levels are going very low. So I think he's got to talk to those players. I think everyone is uh, in agreement and on the same page uh, when you're talking about transition process, but you can't go the other extreme. 
And now I think the next goal for uh, a chairman of selectors is the tour of South Africa 2013, uh, which is the uh, end of 2013. And uh, they've got to you know, take into account that India's stature and reputation as this number one test team was shattered overseas. And that's where they've got to look to restore it. Maybe not get the number one ranking back, but certainly the respect of the rest of the world can only be achieved not by winning at home on turning pitches, but playing well and competing in overseas conditions. And that should be the short term sort of goal for Indian cricket and that tour of South Africa. And that's where you don't want your team packed with all youngsters. Maybe it will be a way forward, but you want to also be slightly reasonable and maybe have one of the aging players around to also gu guide the younger lot, you know, to play properly. So that's where I think the communication skills have to come into picture or not so much skills, but just an open dialogue with people like Lakshman, people like Dravid, Tindulkar, find out their plans and see whether it coincides with the plans that you have. There are so many peripheral changes that we can talk about, restructuring and all that, sporting pitches, things like that. But if you have to get down to brass tacks, I think change of personnel would be an important step to take. And that's where I think uh, India need some young top order batsmen you know there is a fear that the middle order will certainly uh, suddenly get hollow if you look to phase out certain people but my view is actually middle order may not be as much of a problem as number one two and three could be i feel sehwag and gambhir cannot be your overseas opening partnership again you know when you go to south africa because they have proved and confirmed that they are a bit of a lottery as an opening pair in overseas conditions so i think when they need one two three young solid batsmen maybe gambir could come down to number three because let's not forget sehwag i think it's a matter of time that he comes down the order if, if i was the selector he would have played his last test match as an opener i would move him down the order which means i get some experience with another stalwart in the middle and there's all already virat kohli there who's gaining in confidence so the middle order starts looking a little more you know robust and Rohit Sharma also will bat down the order. I don't think he'll be my number three batsman. He'll be more my number six batsman at this stage. So what India needs is a couple of young top order batsmen, which means a young opener and somebody who can be good at number three. And then you're looking at a lineup that has a fair bit of experience in the middle, some promise at the top. And of course, the bowling also needs to be sorted out, but that's not such, a, such an issue. And there, perhaps you don't have too many choices.